okay? Uh, we've had five minutes uh, no more delay and I think it's time to start. Um, it's really my pleasure to introduce Johan. Most of you know him already, so I won't be long. And, I, and furthermore, I guess you have read uh, his bio on the program. M many, like me, know him because of his long-standing engagement in Centometrics and in having established a long-lasting now and high-flying uh, uh, research center for research on evaluation science and technology. People forget about the full title. The shorter time title is Crest. But I may say that I knew far less on a similar long-term engagement in doctoral training, which I consider critical for the future of the field. Okay, Johan is going to propose you a reflection of what indicators are beyond what they are, what they do or what they are used for. He sees them as referential measures, and this drives him to discuss the deep structure underlying STI indicators, without which it is very difficult to understand the meaning of indicators. And he will illustrate that by taking university and doctoral studies, again, preparing the future in South Africa. So, Johan, the floor is yours. While we wait for the presentation uh, to load, uh, let me just, first of all, thank the organizers for the invitation. Um, I think it's a difficult spot on a Friday morning after a very nice dinner that we had last night. Um, so I want to thank for the invitation. And then perhaps uh, uh, since I have to leave this afternoon and other people will have the opportunity, can I also just express my gratitude to the organizers Jordi, Ismail, everyone for the great logistics. Um, I think the organization has been great and at least for, for of one of three representatives from South Africa, we agree that this is a very well organized conference. So uh, I'm not sure that I should load this or some technicians should load it. I can do this. Right, so uh, as uh, uh, Philippe has said, uh, my talk will start with some basic reflection on STI indicators. Uh, not for long, because just as my way of background, my main argument in this talk this morning is that uh, we have to look beyond the surface level of indicators if we want to understand the meaning of these indicators for policy and evaluation. And to illustrate that, I will use two examples. Uh, all these, although these examples are from South Africa, they address more general, more universal issues. The one is about university rankings, and the other one is about PhD production. And then I'll conclude well, with a few general observations. Um, in my view, one of the interesting developments over the last 15, 20 years has been the fact that two fairly distinct, initially two distinct disciplines, if you want to call them, the discipline of program evaluation, sometimes just referred to as M&E, and the field of evaluative scientometrics, evaluative bibliometrics, have started to become much closer. Uh, some of you will know program evaluation as a discipline in the social sciences has its origins in the 1960s, mostly in the USA, and it has a long history and its focus is about programs as social interventions. Evaluative bibliometrics, cytometrics, I think has a more recent uh, history as since the, at least the 1980s, the work of Ben Martin, and of course the RAE feel that, uh, and of course over the last 15, 20 years, as many authors at this conference have indicated, there has been this relentless spread of new accountability regimes, new public management has been mentioned, and this has fueled uh, the interest in evaluative scientometrics. My own interest is because I've been, for the last 25 years, I've run a center, Crest, which does both. We do program evaluation 
research and teaching, and for the last 15 years, evaluate the evaluative science metrics. So this is, in a sense, part of the background to this paper. Um, one of the things that I think is important for people who work in evaluative or scientometrics generally is that the moment that you talk about STI indicators, we have to realize that there's a long body of knowledge, quite a significant body of knowledge in M and E. Uh, some of that, by the way, goes back to the uh, uh, interesting social indicator movement of the 1960s and 70s, where a lot of been written, many books, many articles about the nature of indicators. Uh, yesterday, Monica Salazar, in a very interesting but brief presentation, started to refer to some of this. And there are many typologies, classifications of indicators, between quantitative indicators that some people say these are basically metrics, but there are also qualitative indicators which don't uh, um, meet the criteria of, of being metrics. But there are distinctions like objective and subjective, direct and indirect, formal, informal, and yesterday others were mentioned composite indicators. So to my mind, if we work in STI and we ignore the value of those debates, we are slightly impro impoverished. So let me start, and this might be very basic stuff and I'll be quite quick about this. Um, one of the definitions in the field of M&E, which I think is one of the better definitions of an indicator is this one by United Nations AIDS, UNAIDS, and for them, an indicator provides a sign or a signal that something exists or is true. It, an indicator, is used to show the presence or state of a situation or condition in the context of monitoring and evaluation. An indicator is a quantitative metric that provides information to monitor performance, measure achievement, and determine accountability. Now, the reason why I like this, in this definition is that it reminds us that indicators are measures that make both ontological claims and epistemological claims. They make an ontological claim that something exists, that the indicator refers to something, some object or entity. But an indicator can also be used in an argument of reasoning to make a knowledge claim, an epistemological claim. And that's something with, with is either true or false. Um, one of the things that is slightly frustrating when you look at the literature on indicators is that many definitions tell you what indicators do, what their function is, what the utility is, rather than what they are. And I always say to my students, it's like defining a dog as something that keeps watch over your house or something that plays with the children than trying to capture what its nature is. And in the field of logic, as some of you will know, this is referred to as a definitional fallacy. You don't define primarily something by listing what it does you try to, to capture something about its nature, of course not in an essentialist way. Now here's an example of a definition which I think is a poor definition because it does exactly that. It just tells you what indicators do. This definition from uh, some American NGO says indicators are signposts of change along the path of development. They make it possible to demonstrate results. They can also help in producing results provide providing a reference point for monitoring, decision-making, et cetera. And then they say, in particular, indicators can help to measure progress and achievements, clarify consistency between activities, ensure legitimacy and accountability to all stakeholders, and assess project and staff performance. This is just a list of functions that indicators do, and of course, indicators perform other functions as well. So I want to come back to the more basic question what are indicators? And my response is a very simple one, and that is that they are a certain kind of measure. They are the results of measurement or observation. When I measure some property of an object, like the length or height of a person, I have to use a unit of measurement, like centimeters, and a calibrated measuring instrument. And uh, when the object is directly visible, I can do direct measurement. Then I don't need an indicator. I don't need an indicator of my height, I just measure it. And I see so very often that people make that mistake when they talk about output indicators. But indicators in the social sciences, of which scientometrics, of course, is a subdiscipline. We should never forget that scientometrics is essentially a social science, are social indicators. We measure social phenomena, such as the status, health status of a nation, or the quality of life of people, or in our field, scientific performance, innovation, research collaboration, and many more. 
So social indicators are a subclass of measures, and they are in fact what I call referential social measures. They refer or point to something that is often not directly observable or measurable. And of course, the interesting thing is that many of the interesting features of science, and we had a little bit of that debate already in some sessions, refer to things that we cannot directly measure, like scientific performance, investment in science, research quality, scientific excellence. In the terms of measurement, we refer to these things, like scientific excellence, as constructs or theoretical concepts, because they refer to things that are not directly measurable. They are phenomena or states of human behavior or institutions that are not directly observable, and therefore we need indicators. Uh, again, to go back to my original definition, from an ontological point of view, social indicators point to the exist of, existence of these things or phenomena, and from an epistemological point of view, we can only make knowledge claims about these phenomena by gathering evidence for our indicators. And of course, the big issues are whether our indicators are relevant, valid, etc., etc. So, most of the much of the work in the field of scientometrics and bibliometrics. In, in over the last 30, 40 years, in my view, have focused on methodological issues and technical ex aspects. How can we improve our indicators and metrics? Are our indicators relevant, well-defined, have they required the required construct validity? A lot of work, as we've seen also at this conference, goes into the cleaning the underlying data sources, understanding the relationship between our indicators and the data. Uh, otherwise, we can't meet the criteria of reliability and consistence, consistency. But of course, and this is a, a slightly different issue, not all scientometric and bibliometric work that, that we find adheres to good methodological practice. And this in fact has led, uh, last year there was an interesting conference in Leiden, or two years ago, that led to attempts to formulate good codes of good practice in bibliometrics. Uh, and the Leiden Manifesto is one example of this. Now, in the next two slides, which I will go through very quickly, I just given six bibliometric rules of good practice. They are not particularly new, and you will recognize most of them, but I thought, well, just to, to try to capture the methodological focus. The first, uh, the first rule of, of good practice, I think, is, is the old GIGO rule, garbage in, garbage out. Any measurement, and of course, using indicators, uh, is only as good as the underlying data. That is very obvious. The rule of small samples. Uh, we all know that any form of scientific measurement, again, applies to bibliometrics and scientometrics, have to confront the problem of sampling error, which is more prevalent when the sample of objects is very small or the objects that are being measured are not normally distributed. The rule of the ecological fallacy, this is a term that some of you will recognize from the field of sociological methodology. This rule was formulated in the 1950s and 60s in the field of sociology. When you do measurement at one level, you cannot necessarily apply the results at a lower level of this aggregation. And I think the most obvious example in the field of bibliometrics uh, are the various abuses of the journal impact factor, which is a journal level metric. And then people say, well, I've published in a high impact journal, so my paper also you know, have a high citation rate. And we know that there's a, not a strong correlation between journal impact factors and the individual citation rates of papers in those journals. The fourth rule, again, is a very basic rule, the rule of comparing apples and oranges or pears. The, the, given the huge differences across different scientific disciplines uh, between the humanities, the social sciences, and the medical sciences, health, life sciences, th these have huge consequences for research performance. And therefore, compare any form of comparative bibliometrics or scientometrics at whatever level, whether you compare institutions or fields or individuals even, must adhere to the rule of comparing like and like. And therefore, we teach our students in bibliometrics that normalization should be the rule rather than exception when you compare across these very diverse contexts. The rule of partial indicators, uh, this notion of partial indicators came from Brian Martin's study in the 1980s. We simply have to live with the fact, I believe, that not every aspect of science can, in fact, be measured quantitatively on strong and to a strong metrics. To my mind, research or knowledge production is a very complex construct because of disciplinary, epistemological, methodological, sociological differences, and I'm not convinced that we can capture the complexity of science and knowledge production in our metrics as well. Our met the complexity 
will always be underdetermined by the metrics that we have. And the final rule which I use with my own students is the rule of non-reductionism. When we are confronted in scientometrics with measuring the more intangible dimensions of research, such as research quality or research collaboration, there's a tendency to select indicators that are at best proxies. We know that they are proxies. And then even though we know that they are proxies, we tend to reduce the full meaning or content of that property to this one measure. For me, one of the best examples is this construct of research collaboration. Our best measures, bibliometric measures of research collaboration, is co-authorship of papers. But you only have to read 10 papers on research collaboration to know that it's a much richer concept than what is captured by co-authorship. And so here we have to guard against the, the danger of reducing the notion of research collaboration to what we can measure through research quality. And of course, there are other examples. So this is just a slight detour to say that to my mind, a lot of the work that's been done in bibliometric centers have been to, to enforce these rules, to make these rules clearer. But my paper today is about what I would suggest is a seventh rule, which is not a methodological rule. It's a rule, it's more a epistemological rule. It's about our imperative that we must understand what I call the deep structures of the social phenomena or objects that our indicators refer to. So I'm just going to change track a bit. And this, this argument for an understanding of the deep structure of our indicators is in line with a realist epistemology, for those of you who are interested in the philosophy of science. And my argument is quite simple. Um, first of all, scientometric indicators, and there are many examples, but such as you find in the composite score in a ranking system, are referential measures that refer to social phenomena or objects that are real even if they're not visible. And they're real because they have causal effects. That's the argument. As social phenomena, these constructs are historically and culturally defined and embedded in systemic and institutional structures. And therefore, to make optimal sense of these indicators, we have to, by way of necessity, need to understand how these social phenomena that, are the, that contain these social structures came about. And this, in its terms, requires a contextual understanding. So this, is, in, a, in a nutshell, is my argument. So um, that has a few consequences, which I'll elaborate on. I don't, I don't think our indicators are, not, are neutral to context. In fact, the vast majority of current in STI indicators have their origin in the north, to come to the, another topic of the, of the conference. And they typically reflect, if you look at most of the OECD indicators and the Eurostat indicators and other indicator systems, they typically reflect the properties of the science systems in these regions. Indicators both originate and are applied in different social historical contexts. Uh, unless we make an attempt to understand what a specific indicator means in context, we are very likely to draw incorrect and sometimes very implausible conclusions. So this, this plea for a contextual understand, an understanding and analysis of the deep structure of indicators also, I don't think, equate to a relativist epistemology. I'm not saying that this is a case where anything goes in scientific measurement. We can still make defensible and credible claims, knowledge claims, if we specify the conditions and the parameters under which we make these claims. So now I'm going to move to two examples. The first has to do with university rankings, and I'm going to go straight to the, what people now have this very often call the, the Shanghai ranking, academic ranking of world's universities. Now, I think many of you know what are the indicators that are used in the Shanghai ranking, but just to refresh your memory, um, they have, and the weighting is given there, so the criteria, by the way, which I don't think is criteria, I think these are the constructs that they're trying to measure, but that's another story. So they have an indicator of an, the alumni of an institution winning Nobel Prizes, that, that gives you a weight of 10% in your score. Then they have quality of faculty, where they where there's current staff with Nobel Prizes, that, give, that, gets, that earns the institution 20%. So basically 30% of the weight of the composite score is linked to alumni in some way. And as many of you know, huge contestation now about universities who claim that that alumni studied here and then worked here and used our laboratory here. So some, the same different universities now claim one person as their alumnus, just to get that additional weighting in Shanghai. Um, 
highly cited researchers in 21 broad subject categories in the web of science, that's 20%, the research output in, two paper, uh, in the two top journals, Nature and Science, and then papers indexed in the Science Citation Index again, and the Social Science Index, 20%, also uh, in the web of science. Uh, what is very interesting about the Shanghai ranking, there's only one normalizing indicator, and that's the last one where the, the size of the, of the institution is not counted until you get to the last institution, uh, the last indicator, per capita performance. And that only constitutes 10%, which I think is a major flaw uh, in, the, in the way it's calculated. But so, just to remind you, so in a certain sense, if you look at this, 30% of the weight of the composite score has to do with Nobel alumni or current staff, but 70%, it really means that if you want to be, your university has to be, wants to be on the Shanghai ranking, it has to have a great presence in the web of science journals, of course, nature and science, cited within the web of science. So if, unless your institution does not have a presence in the web of science, as I will show, it doesn't have a big chance of getting in there. Now, in South Africa, we, there are four universities that have consistently been in the top 500. That's the University of Cape Town, UCT, which is the highest ranked. I've given you for 2012, 13, and 14. Uh, UCT is somewhere between 200 and 300. Wits University in Johannesburg, Stellenbosch University, which is my own university, and then University of KwaZulu-Natal. Now, I often get asked the question by research directors at these universities, and of course, especially my own university, how can we improve our position, you know? Uh, I said, if you pay me enough, I can tell you, but I'm not sure that, you, that we know exactly how you do that, because it's a zero-sum game. Everyone else wants to improve their position. But I'm not so interested in that score. You see, I'm interested to understand why are these universities and not other South African universities? We have 25 public universities. Why are the other 21 not on this? Is it because they're not simply not good enough or are there other reasons? And this brings me to my point to illustrate the notion of a deep explanation. Because I want to look at the underlying reasons and causes which are embedded in structures because I think there's a structural explanation why this is the case. So what must a South African university, and this applies to any university, do to get into the Shanghai ranking? It must have that current Nobel laureate or Nobel alumnus, all the other indicators as web of science. And as I said, and now I need to just explain one pe peculiar feature of the South African research system before I can proceed with my explanation. We have a rather unique system for rewarding scientific publication. It was established in 1987 and it's still in force. Literally, it means that every staff member at a South African university, when they publish in a journal which is on a list, and there are three lists, then their university gets 7,000 uh, 7, US dollars, approximately, for that journal. So my university, for instance, if it produces 1,000 papers per year, that, would, that year we would get seven million dollars from the state because we are publishing in a list of journals. In the entire subsidy system last in 2014 paid out more than 130 million dollars to South African universities on the basis of this performance-based system. It is not an insignificant funding system. Now what is the key feature of it? The Department of Education and Training that runs this recognizes three lists. Number one, Web of Science. Thomson Reuters Web of Science, the core collection. Secondly, a ProQuest list called IBSS, the International Bibliography of the Social Sciences. If you haven't heard of it, don't be surprised because I don't think it's a major list. It should never have been there, but anyway. And then, in order to promote local South African journals, they also recognize if you publish in 220 South African journals. And here's the thing, the majority of them are in the social sciences, humanities, law, education, not medicine, not natural sciences. So they cater for, the, you could argue that's a very good thing because it means that essentially, to give you an example, there are 25 South African law journals on that list. They're not in web of science anywhere. There are 25 theology journals. If the state didn't subsidize publication in those journals, they would probably go under. So in, this is an indirect way of, of subsidizing the journals. So let me show you, I've taken uh, 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 eight of the top universities. I've taken the four universities that are on the web of science. And what I've done here, you only really need to look at the relationship between the red and the green part of the bar. So this is UCT, 
uh, on the left hand side, then WITS, Stellenbosch, UKZN. The four that were consistently, that are consistently in the Weapons Times ranking. The red part is the proportion of their total outputs in the Web of Science. The green part is what they publish in the local South African journals which are not in Web of Science. Now the first thing is remember to, to be counted, to be ranked, you have to have a high presence. So the first thing is to say it's not surprisingly and it's not an accident that UCT, which is consistently the highest ranked, 90% of its papers, the other 8% appears in the humanities, social sciences, are in medicine and natural sciences, and they publish in the web of science. And the same applies to WITS, Stellenbosch. We've calculated that the university, if it doesn't get to about 75% of its papers in the web of science, and at least a minimum threshold, will not make it into the rankings. The other university, this is the University of Pretoria, University of Free State, Northwest. And I want to just show you this because I'm gonna come back to this. UNISA, the University of South Africa, is one of the biggest correspondence universities, distance universities in the world. It has 400,000 students. But it's basically, it has two big colleges, College of Law and a College of Humanities, which makes up 80% of its publications. They don't have a medical school. They cannot do that over correspondence. They don't have an engineering faculty. So it's essentially a humanities college. This is their profile. They only publish 20% of their papers in the web of science. So you can see, I got a call from the BBC for research at UNISA one day and says, how does UNISA get into the, web of, uh, into the Shanghai ranking? I said, well, dream on, you can't do that. Because you don't, simply don't publish enough in the web of science even to be on the radar screen of, Sh of Shanghai. So forget about quality, it's just about not being there. So this, um, this leads me to the next uh, issue, and that is that these very different publication profiles of the universities, because I can show you all 25, they, very, they range from this, brings me to the kind of the, a little bit about the history of South African universities. And I'll, I'll take one slide to, to explain it with two examples. In South Africa, the university system, of course, is not unrelated.